This video is on some sun tracking I did the summer of 2017. Um, for just from my backyard, so it's always the same location. And I thought I would start out showing you some things from timeanddate.com, which at least for my location seems to be accurate. And I'm sure that if it weren't, um, that there were uh, significant and consistent um, fudge data that people around the world would have said something by now. And as I said, as, at least in my location, it has proved to be accurate. Now, what we're looking at here is an illustration of the path of the sun from two different places on Earth, one north of the equator and one south. You can see, I don't know, it might be too small to, to see, but the, the one on the left is from uh, Kansas and the U.S., and the one on the right is from the Northern Territories in Australia for the same day. And so this is a comparison of the path of the sun. That arc you see in the yellow line in the circle is not the sun going overhead. That's not an altitude indicator. It's an azimuth indicator. And that's the main first point I want to make is the difference between those two things. Azimuth is an angle along the ground. And so we can see what these two pictures are telling us is that the sun uh, will rise somewhat north of our position. And as it moves toward the middle of the day, it is south of our position. And at sunset, it is north again. The opposite is true in the Southern Hemisphere. It starts out south of our position. We're, we're looking north. Uh, both of these circles are, are um, pointing north. It starts south of our location, moves north, and then goes south again. And this, of course, is east to west. Let me show these two circles again. I superimpose them, well, not on top of each other, but one above the other. And the uh, you can see that these two sun paths are mirror images, basically, different little shape, but they both arc toward the equator. Think of this line between the two pictures as the equator. This is, of course, not to scale. But we can see that they, you could call that kind of like a pinch toward the middle. That's the way the sun appears to move from every location on the Earth at any given time. And that's physically impossible. The sun can't arc toward the equator uh, going north to south and south to north at the same time, on the same day, at the same hour. Okay, there'd be different locations on the Earth, but they're still pointing toward the, the equator either way. So let me show what's uh, next a time zone map, um, just a standard time zone map I grabbed off the internet, and I added some of these arcs to that because this is the way they point, and they do this for every time zone. And even, you know, any little point between will have its own little arc appearing wherever you're standing. Um, and here, once again, this north, we got, I added this thick blue line for the equator, here is south they arc toward the equator. So this is apparently, not to scale again, but apparently what the sun seems to be doing every day. This is not a seasonal issue. The red X's here are the points that those two circles were at that I showed you just a little bit ago. This is about where Kansas is. This is about the Northern Territory. And so they are arcing toward each other. It was just, like as I said, different locations along the surface of the Earth. But how do we account for this movement? This is an observation. This is what science does. They observe first. You're supposed to, at least, if you want to really call it science, observe first. And what we observe from every location on any given day is that the sun will do a north-south arc as it goes across east to west. And to do this for everyone at every location, every uh, longitude and latitude, is physically impossible. So there's something else going on here. This is what our observation is telling us. Okay, and remember again that these arcs are not distance overhead. This is moving north and south. Okay, now let's look a little bit more about altitude and azimuth. I think this is a picture I want to show. Um, I drew some images to try to illustrate this, and curiously, the one on the upper left looks kind of like a baseball. But here's this arc toward the equator, 
And azimuth is a degree angle starting from north, going around clockwise everywhere you go on Earth. This is how compasses are made. They point north and they'll give you degrees. It starts one to the first tick right of north and goes around to 360. Some people call this 360 also. Um, you, you can designate it either way. It's the zero point because it... If you want to call it 360, the, all you have to remember is the next point clockwise is one, one degree. So we have 90 degrees, because this is a 90 degree angle, and then another 90 is 180, and so on, 270, 360. That's how circles are divided up. It's been that way for thousands of years. Yes, it is arbitrary to choose that number of degrees. I think it has something to do with Babylonian uh, six-based or something numbers, I forget, but... Um, it is what it is, and it's, it's immaterial as long as we consistently use the same measure and we have. So um, azimuth is an angle horizontally. If we're looking down at the earth, down at any spot on the earth, and you point your compass north, you're going to have east, due east as 90 degrees, due west as 270, and so on. So these, the sun's path is going east to west. But north of the equator, it seems to, it is observed to arc toward the equator to its farthest point it's going to go that day at uh, solar noon and then start arcing back north again and the opposite, the mirror image in the uh, south of the equator. But it's always measured clockwise from north. Okay, that is azimuth. Here again, we can see azimuth as the green circle here. See, you're above the circle and looking down at it at a little bit of an angle so we can get some perspective. And here we have, uh, if this is north, this is the 0, 0360 mark, and you're going around here is 90 degrees, 180, 270, back to 360. That is azimuth. That will never change. It's always what people use for navigation to know where they are on the, according to the surface of the Earth. But when you're in 3D space, you need another axis. I'll show you more about the axis in a bit. But the altitude of the sun is the overhead arc, and that too is measured in degrees. 90 degrees straight up is directly overhead, and it will, you will never have a degree higher than 90 when you're talking about altitude. It can't go any straighter than straight up. So you have degrees from 0 to 90 on either side of this, or you can call it uh, you know, going to 180, but you'll never have more than 180 total, depending on how you choose to designate the other side of the circle. Um, but the point is that 90 degrees is straight up. So altitude and azimuth represent the vertical, the yellow half circle, and the horizontal, the green circle, angles, okay? And they're always in degrees. And that will give you the position of something in the sky. You need azimuth and angle, and you'll see that on timeanddate.com. Okay, now let's see another one on these azimuth and angles. And we may come back to this later. I will when I talk about the four motions of the sun. But right now, I just want to show again, here in the green circle is the azimuth, and then up above will be the altitude. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. So now let me um, look at sunspots because we're going to talk about the rotation of the sun. What I have here, these are pictures I took of the sun all summer of 2017. The black lines with the arrowheads represent where I had a week of good sunny weather which is rare where I live, and some sunspots to watch, which is also where you need those two things, and it's a, a, a gamble whether you're going to get that. And I happened to get that this summer, and uh, this past summer, and the start of the black lines is where the sunspots were at the beginning of the week. So I had a spot here, a spot here, and a spot here. And over the course of one day, is where the black line goes and where it ends up by the end of the day. So the outermost spot went clockwise really far around the, toward the edge. 
The next spot in, which was a little behind, also did something very similar. The spot that was toward the center also moved clockwise, but not as great a distance. As you might expect, if the center point of a wheel is turning, the outer edges are going to move. If you spin the thing, they're going to move a lot faster. So if you have these straight lines like spokes on a wheel, whatever is on the outer edges, the um, extremities of these spokes is going to move a lot faster than what's in the center. The center will just turn on its axis and won't turn very fast. You've seen this on uh, a line of skaters on a skating rink where they have a line of all of them all in a row and they start to go around in one direction or the other. And the person in the middle doesn't move much at all. But the person on the extreme ends, th those people are really having to skate fast to keep up to keep the line straight. It's the same thing going on here. But we don't just have a daily motion, we have a weekly motion. See, I guess this would be more accurate to call this an hourly motion, and the clockwise. And then we have from day to day, this, for example, this outermost spot began to move in toward the center. And it wound up here by the end of the week to the blue line. So the yellow line is across the week and then the blue line is what it did on the last day. So I have the first day in black, the last day in blue, and the yellow lines are the transitions from one day to the next where the spot started at the beginning of the day. So we can see that this outermost spot started way out here, moved toward the center by the end of the week, and it still kept going clockwise, but it was a much shorter distance, just like the original first spot, or the, the third spot on the first day. The second spot, likewise, moved in the same general direction. And on the last day, it too also moved clockwise about the same distance as the first spot. The last one that started out in the middle also moved across the face, a little bit of an arc. But by the time the last day, it's, remember, its first path over the course of the hours of the day was kind of short because it was in the center. But then when it went to the outside, it got very long. So we can see what the spots are telling us is that wherever they start, over the course of days, they're going to move across the face of the sun, but not just horizontally to our view on Earth. They're moving at this general angle. I drew this green line, the darker green line, to kind of average out the yellow lines, the direction. So we can see the sun seems to be rotating across like that on its axis. But on a daily basis, it's rotating like a clock through the hours of the day. That's observation. The question is why? What is causing this observation? Okay, now before I go on to an experiment I did that showed why it's not a camera trick, let me show you if I can find the right uh, image here about standard cosmologies model for uh, earth tilt and seasons and daily sun motion. Over on the left, the upper left, we see a model of the a drawing of the sun, a cartoon with the north and south pole. That's its axis that it spins on and how long it takes for different areas of the sun to spin. That apparently spins at different speeds being made of gas according to the standard theory, whatever it's made of. Nobody seems to think it's a solid body, but um, Things move a lot slower, it, it are a, a lot faster, I'm sorry, at the equator. That's the outermost rim, okay? That's where it has to move fastest. It's just the farthest distance if, for each half circle is going to be the equator. That's the widest part from our perspective as it spins on its axis. So it only takes 25 days for something, a spot, to move across at the equator but it takes 35 days for it to move here, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we were saying. Um, in one way you think of it, you would think, well, it, it's going to, if it's all moving the same speed, it would be um, not like the skaters, you know, that I mentioned earlier, but we have things that are not moving at the same speed along the surface, the outer surface of a sphere, which is kind of hard to visualize. But what they're saying is that things in the center don't move as far on a given week or a number of days. And things along the equator move 
much faster. And we saw that in this diagram. When they get to the center, they don't move as much. This is a far shorter distance than it was on the same group of spots than they were on the edge. So this is just, uh, this kind of, I would say, consistent with the fact that this being, the equator being the outer edge, things would appear to move faster. Okay, so they attribute, here's the alleged tilt of the Earth, and what are they, first of all, lining up these, these axes with? Both are more or less pointing toward Polaris. We know the, the Earth points toward Polaris, but the sun is a little bit off. I forget which other star that they say it points to, but they're fairly similar. It's not like they're perpendicular, which is, would be a cross. You know, that's perpendicular. So we have this 23.5 angle where the earth is allegedly tilted uh, northernly toward the sun in what is summer in the north. And then, of course, the opposite would be true as allegedly it moves around to this side. Then this because it won't change its angle, then this uh, quadrant of the Earth will be pointed toward the sun, and that's how they explain seasons. But what we won't see, you see this red X in the middle of a circle here, from the Earth we will never see, because of the sun's rotation, we will never see this clockwise motion that we observed in the spots. So we can tell that we're not looking down at the sun's axis. We're not looking down at the sun's north pole. So since we're not doing that, we still don't know what's causing the clockwise motion. Now let me explain something else here. This, if this is Earth, okay, the, we're on the sun and we're looking at the Earth spinning. This is the motion we're gonna see. Okay, the Earth is spinning like that because that's why this, to us, the sun is going east to west. So the Earth must be spinning this way since the sun, as far as its path along the sky is not spinning spinning as far as we can tell. When there are no spots in the sun, you can't tell it's spinning and in any direction. But what I'm saying is if you're looking at the sun or the sun is looking at the earth and looking at you standing there, it's going to see you do this. Okay. Doesn't matter whether you're on the equator, north of it or south of it, it's still going to have that motion because it's tilted like this toward the sun and spinning this direction. So no matter where you are, you could draw any number of lines, they would all arc the same way. But what did we see on our observations before? We saw this. They don't arc the same way, depending on whether you're north or south of the equator. How can that be? They should all arc the same way. Here's another angle, before we move on, of the sun's path, no matter where you are, say right now, say you're, you're facing south, the sun rises over here and it sets over here in the west. But as it moves, depending on your latitude, it's going to be at an angle like that. It isn't just moving straight overhead unless you're at the equator or within the tropics at certain times of year. And by the way, what a tropic is, is just it's from a Greek word that means to turn around and go back. And that is... Um, why they are called the tropics is because that's the farthest point the sun will go 90 degrees overhead. That's what a tropic is. That's the limit of where you can be away from the equator, north or south, and the sun will at some point in the year go directly overhead. That's why they're the tropics. Okay. If you're not in the tropics zone, then you will see the sun go at some kind of an angle, and that angle will change slightly from day to day as you move through the seasons. But for example, where I live, it will never go much more than 70 degrees overhead. And this is probably true of the mirror image latitude south of the equator. So the question is, if we're holding a camera watching the sun, as it follows the sun east to west, should the camera, in order to watch it properly, stay parallel to the yellow arc. That is to say, I would angle my camera at whatever changing angle this is so that by the time it's solar noon, it's basically horizontal. And then I start angling back to follow this arc. Is this my, my horizontal plane as far as the camera is concerned? Should I angle it? Or should it stay parallel to the green surface of the earth here? As I'm watching the sun, should I keep my camera horizontal the whole time? 
What should I do? And if the camera is causing the appearance of sun rotation, that clockwise rotation, which is what we observed, which direction should the camera be causing, counterclockwise or clockwise? Knowing that I'm moving like this, knowing that the sun sees me moving like that, should I keep horizontal to the plane I'm standing on or the plane that's at an angle where the sun is arcing? So those are questions we need to ask ourselves about how we can explain, how we can model what's going on. Because the laws of physics being what we can observe and repeat on Earth, that's hard physics, not theoretical physics. Not hard isn't difficult, but concrete, physical. That's why it's physics. Um, by those rules, there should be some way to explain this. Okay. So let me, um, a video I think I want to show next instead. And this is where I did an experiment about camera angles. So I'm going to play that next and then um, we'll get back to our still shots. Okay, I'm going to try to do this without getting too many doggy distractions and things. This is the sun, okay? And got some spots and everything, and it's pointing north the way I showed in the diagram. And uh, what we want to do is simulate the motion of, like I said in the diagram, about the smiley face, you know, where it um, is going to start a little elevated and then move down and move back up, but we're staying horizontal to the ground. And so what I need to do then is to... Um, take my camera as if it's, um, you know, we what, and move it in a way that makes it look like that arc, like that yellow arc. So what I would do is say I'm looking east and fairly level to the ground, but as, this, as we move through the day, I'm moving down and keeping my camera parallel to the sun. Okay, I scoot my chair over and the sun's going across the sky and then it goes back down again. Okay, sorry, it's a little too far there. But what did the sun do? Which way did it turn? Did it turn clockwise or counterclockwise? No, it turned left to right and a little bit vertically. Like if you look, uh, if you're looking across at it and then it's going up in your sky so you're kind of down here, the vertical movement is going to make the sun appear to be as if it was rolling toward you and away from you. Sorry if I'm making you seasick here, but I'm trying to simulate our motion of keeping my camera horizontal on the ground. So we, the elevation, keeping it horizontal, can account for a, a rolling toward you, away from you motion, okay? And following it east to west, like here I'm looking at it from the east, I moved over here, and then I move across, you know, the sun moves across the sky to me, and I'm going like this. Which motion is that? That's a left to right motion. Neither of those are clockwise motions. Okay? Now that's keeping the camera horizontal, as I've been doing in all my sunspot videos. Now what if I want to do it as if I was going to follow the sun at its arc along that yellow line? Well, I would start out with the sun in the east, and I would tilt my camera like this. See, I've, I've got it. I know it looks the opposite the way it, it, you're seeing it, but what I'm doing is I'm tilting my camera to follow the sun's path, its arc. So as it goes through the sky, my camera's going to tilt like till the midday, solar noon. Hey, look at that hot spot. It's going to be straight up and down. And then by the end of the day, I'm doing the opposite angle. So I'm following that yellow line, that arc. So again, now which way is the sun turning? This time it's doing a clock motion, but which way? Let's start again. See, I'm starting here. I'm in the, I'm looking east at the sun. I'm following the, the arc is going to go to my right. Now as I go through the day, which way are the sunspots going? Which way are all the lines going? They're going counterclockwise, and I'm following the arc as if I were on an equatorial mound. So, because I've been thinking about I should try to do this experiment with the actual sun, but 
I wanted to show, even if I do that, I don't know if I'll bother now, um, because I know what result I'll get. I just proved it. The sunspot should move counterclockwise. One more time. If I'm starting at this angle, and through the day I'm doing this, the camera is going clockwise, but the spots are going counterclockwise. Now, since it's observed that the spots go clockwise, either the Earth is spinning the opposite way we're told, which it can't be because the sun rises in the east, or that sun is rotating in a clockwise motion, and it can't be explained by us looking at it either its north or south pole. So there you go. Back to our still shots, and I saw showed you this briefly before. What's going on here is I started uh, drawing these things when I was making sundials last summer. Because you have to understand what's going on to make a sundial work. I mean, people have pre-calculated these things, but I like to understand why they do what they do. <clears throat> and in the lower right corner, you can see how you would make a sundial, how you would calculate it for your area on Earth. The point that makes the shadow is called the gnomon, or however you pronounce that. You would put your sundial on this surface of a triangular shape, and you can calculate the angles and distances using trigonometry, and you can find whatever... You know, you can do some searching online to find what works for you best. You can have flat sundials, but then, uh, you know, lay it horizontal on the ground, but then you have to change the angles. If you have a sundial that's up at this angle, uh, then every part, every uh, hour of the sundial for 12 hours is exactly 15 degrees. And I verified this. I made both kinds of sundials. The flat one takes a lot of calculation. There are, thankfully, people who have done that. For You plug in your longitude and latitude, and it will calculate each angle. And then you have to measure out those angles on something flat and then uh, set it outside and put some a stick here to make the shadow. And it works. If you line both of these up with 12 or noon, where the, the gnomon here with noon at the bottom here pointing at Polaris, then it will work. Both of them will work. They, they've kept time. I've got pictures of them keeping time together throughout a day, and they work. Okay, so these aren't just mathematical trickery. This is actual working, verifiable, repeatable experiment. So we can see that whatever the sun's doing is predictable and consistent. But what I've also observed is that the clock rotation, as we go throughout the day, and I lined it up with the, you know, tried to give you some um, perspective here on where we are throughout the day. The sun will rise fairly quickly, slow down at the middle of the day as far as its altitude change, and then speed up again as it sets. That's the speed across the sky. But what about the rotation, the clockwise rotation? It also changes speed. Okay? You can see it doesn't, it's very, the small numbers here, but you can see it doesn't seem to change as rapidly. It's, it's really hard to tell. I'm sorry I can't uh, show that better, but uh, I could try to, let me see if I can magnify that a little bit. And move up there. That'll help some. I'm hoping I'm recording this. So we hear, see, watch the 12 here, moves a little, moves a little, then all of a sudden it starts to jump, and then you get back, you know, 12 is pointing this way, and the angles are mirror images, okay? But as it slows its Ang it's uh, angle of elevation, it's altitude. <clears throat> As it gets toward the middle of the day, the rotation speed also changes. It seems to be inversely related. It's not very well done here, I tried, but uh, the point is that this is uh, the angle of um, the degree, the speed of rotation, of clockwise rotation, changes throughout the day and mirror images from solar noon. And solar noon isn't always, is rarely going to match exactly noon by the clock because the clock is not tied to the sun as much as it's tied to the rest of the world so there can be consistent 
so, uh, flight times, for example. It's the speed of travel that made that necessary. You're not trying to fool anybody because you can put a sundial out and know what exactly when solar noon is where you live. And this is, again, calculable. You can uh, take your longitude and latitude and the time, you know, the day of the year and all and so forth, the day of the season, and figure out when solar noon will be. And I've matched it up to time and date. It works for my location is all I know. So once again, let me look over here to this part of the picture. I should have blown this up before. Uh, the altitude is going to change throughout the season. This is, for example, uh, roughly where I live in the northern uh, area above the equator. Um, in the summer, it's going to be higher overhead. That's around 70 some degrees. But as it went toward the equinox, it went to this red line. And in the winter solstice, it went to the blue line. So it was much it's farther, it starts, you can see the starting point and ending point are moving south from solar, uh, from the summer solstice to the winter solstice, and then it'll start moving back. Okay, as it's doing now, it's starting to move back. But that's the east-west uh, location. So here you we can see this is about, um, see if this, if east is 90 degrees, this is a little short of 90 degrees. So say this is about, 80 degrees or so, and the if you add 180 to that, then you'll get, you know, you'll be about like 280 um, degrees or whatever it is on the other side. But by the equinox, it's, it was rising at 90 degrees due east, and then by the winter solstice, it was moving or rising at uh, another uh, 10 degrees on the other side, which would be 100 degrees azimuth. Okay. So the angle of the sun, as far as its path, as it goes east to west, its azimuth is moving south and then north. And it does that all season, all year. It's just how far over ahead, you know, which way you tilt this arc is going to be within a certain range, just like the tropics are within a certain range. Every latitude is going to have this variation from season to season. And you could just spin this dial around and have the same thing if this were north and this were south, this is east and this is west. If you're in the south of the equator, you're going to see the sun rise over here and do the same things through the season. So again, we have that pinch toward the equator. Okay, and uh, I should have been looking at my numbers down here. It was 73.6 here is where it rose in the east at the June solstice, and it was a tilt angle of 23.4 degrees which is very close to the 25.5, the, uh, you know, it, it's just going to vary your angle that the sun is alleged, or the earth is allegedly uh, tilted toward the sun is reflected in these numbers. But don't jump to too many hasty conclusions just yet. So again, uh, we have this three dimensions that I mentioned uh, earlier that I wanted to show you is that the sun is doing something like this. And, you know, regardless of what we're not talking about Earth shape here or anything, we're talking about observation. The sun appears to be following this kind of an oval and the, uh, you know, and we're standing on this oval or circle. So we have an X axis, a Y axis. This is our horizontal plane that lines up with this green circle. And then we have the Z axis, which is vertical. Okay. So the sun is doing at least three motions. It's moving east to west. It's moving north to south and back again. And it's moving up and down. So the sun has three ways that it's moving, but it has a fourth way. That rotation is also happening at the same time. So the sun has four motions. Okay. East to west, north to south, up and down. And clockwise, as it's going through the day, it's spinning like a clock. I mean, it, it's not spinning that fast, but throughout the day, it's going to at least go around close to, I would say, 180 degrees. So if there's a spot on this, the uh, left side of the sun as you watch it, by the end of the day, it's going to be uh, toward the center at least, or farther. Most of the time I observed it went 
no more than 180 degrees, but at least close to that. It went a significant distance. So it was enough to measure, as I showed in the uh, other, the 12, you know, the clocks through every hour of the day. Um, if, if you start with a, a spot on due east, by the end of the day, it's going to be due west or something close to that. So the sun has four motions. And this is what it's doing. And like I said, unless you're at the equator, this, this circle at an angle would be straight up and down, okay, within the tropics at certain times, but at the equator uh, especially, it's going to be straight up and down. But every other latitude, north or south, is going to have an angle like that. Okay, so those are the four motions. So how can we account for all this stuff? This just doesn't make physical sense when you think about it. And you might want to go over the video again on the first part where we showed various uh, models and observations. So let me propose a possible model. First of all, there has to be some kind of lensing effect going on. It's physically impossible for the sun to be doing what it's doing with those hourly arcs uh, if you go along time zones and any location on Earth, it's physically impossible. So there must be some kind of distortion, which I'm calling lensing. And it doesn't have to be just um, water in the atmosphere or something like that. It could be magnetic. The Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field. Everybody agrees about that. And it's a variable magnetic field. Um, but the, th the thing is that Here's a shape that we know, if we study the physics of light, that is called a diverging lens. It is a double concave lens. Concave means it sinks in, it goes in like a cave. Um, and a double concave means that both sides are sinking in. So they pinch toward the middle. This is the principal axis where there's very little to no distortion, right? If you're looking straight through the center. But it, the parallel rays of light hitting this thing at different uh, thicknesses, and that's what makes light refract or bounce in a different direction, is a change of density. Okay, you have to have a change of density. If you look at something underwater, for example, um, you can pretty well line it, up, line it up, but if you're looking at something, you're underwater and you're looking at something above or vice versa, it's going to be at a different angle than you expect. You'll reach out for it and you won't be able to touch it. Okay, so that's the distortion that water can cause, at least. And water is acting like a lens because you have a change of density between the water and the air. That's what where the problem is. So in this double concave lens, and they've done physical experiments, they've gotten double concave pieces of glass and shown uh, light beams through it, different beams, actually, and they did diverge like this, okay? So what that will do is the farther you are away from the equator, so to speak, the more distortion you will have and the farther away this, whatever is the light's coming from will seem to be from where it actually is. So it's distorting the light's location. If you have a light bulb over here, it's going to, if you're, if you're standing here on the other side of the lens, it will look exactly where it is. But if you're over here, if you're far away from the center, you're going to misjudge where that light is. And I think something like that might explain our observations of the sun and its arcing north-south. The tilt of the earth cannot account for that. Let me go back to that for just a second. This tilt, you see these lines? That's the equator. These are other latitudes. Those black lines are not north-south lines. Those are east-west lines. Those are latitude lines. Okay, the earth is spinning like this, allegedly. And so these movements, you, th you might think, well, if I were looking at, at it from the sun, I would see always this uh, arcing, you know, that this accounts for the north-south, but that's not a north-south line. That's an east-west line. This rotation is causing the sun to move east and west, not north and south. So we still have to account for that motion and the clockwise motions, which we're observing, but can't be true since we're not looking at the sun's north pole. So back to this lens, I think something like this must be between the sun and the earth. How might that be possible? We don't observe the lens itself. Well, we don't observe a lot of things that are in the atmosphere. We're, we wouldn't be able to see if, if we could observe everything. But here's a proposed model. 
And again, I'm not talking about earth shape. I'm just talking using this blue um, rectangle to represent the surface of the earth. That's all I'm doing at a particular spot. If you look on the left here, I know it looks like a, a poached egg or something. This is the sun with some kind of, of density around it. And this is the earth with some kind of density around it. I'm only showing half of it because we don't see the underside. What that does is create the double concave shape. If you have two bubbles near each other, the shape between them is double concave because these are both convex. If you put two convex surfaces, convex being the opposite of concave, then what's between them, different in density, will act like a double concave lens. And here's the light source, and here's how it spreads out as you get away from the center. So if you're at the equator here, you're not going to see much distortion. The sun moves straight overhead. It rises straight in the east, 90 degrees. It sets 270 in the west. But not so at any latitude very far beyond the equator on either side. And this is where you get that pinch toward the middle. I'm not saying this is an actual model. It's just a, a scenario, a possibility. Over on the right here, we have the actual position of the sun in the light yellow and the dark, darker reddish orange is the apparent what it appears to be, what we observe. That's our observation, okay? We're in a different density looking through distortion, okay? So if this is noon in the middle of this long double concave lens, which is what the sun would be doing, the sun is actually ab uh, above that lens moving east to west, okay? Here's the equator through the middle. Here's noon. And we're looking north-south here. This is the equator line is the east-west line. Doesn't matter which hemisphere you're in, which whether you're north or south of the equator. The sun is moving across either this way or that way, depending whether you're in the south or the north. Doesn't matter. The sun is moving straight across the middle of this lens. Okay, that's the actual position. The sun is moving nice and straight. That's easily compatible with the laws of physics. It's in motion. It's moving. There's nothing affecting its movement. It's very consistent and predictable. And it's not doing impossible motions at the same time, moving, you know, rising and setting at the same time, basically. But because of the lens, it appears to be making a north-south movement. Okay, for wherever you are, what, and I'm in the north, so I'm going to be starting over here. If you were in the south, you would start over here. This is, to me, east. I'm in the north looking south over this, this line. This is my east-west, so this is east. This is where the sun appears to be, north of where it actually is. As it moves through the day, it gets closer to its actual position because that's the least amount of distortion. I'm not looking through this angle of the double concave lens. If I had an actual lens like this, this long, and that double concave shape, I could do an experiment to prove or disprove this idea. This is just a theory because I don't have a physical model that I can do. But it would be very interesting to see whether this holds true or not. I don't know if it does. It's just something I tried to come up with to explain how the sun could be physically doing one thing and apparently doing another. You have to have some kind of distortion from our viewpoint. And we're on this blue box here, the blue uh, rectangle rather, and looking through a lot of distortion at the extremities, at east and west, at sunrise and sunset. We're looking through a lot of distortion, so the sun is going to appear someplace where it isn't actually in reality. Okay, that's all I can come up with to explain the impossible motion of the sun. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with its rotation clockwise in this particular scene, but that's not a problem, really, because the sun can spin in more than one axis, even if, you know... The fact that the, the sunspot's motion doing this throughout the day and coming back the next day could be that the sun just basically kind of rolls as it moves along, as from our perspective. And it rolls consistently, as I sh showed you in this picture. I tracked it, sunspots over a week, and over the course of the week, they moved in a line like that. Okay? But every day... They were moving like this. So basically, if you could watch it 24-7, it would be going in a spiral 
and moving across. But this is what I think might be happening physically. There has to be a double concave or diverging lens of some sort, whether, again, whether it's water droplets or other aspects of the atmosphere or whether it's the Earth's magnetic field, I don't know. All of those things can, can distort light. So we're working with an apparent position of the sun when we talk about how it rises and sets and at one uh, angle and by solar noon it's at another so it's doing this pinch arc. If I were to draw the apparent sun on the other side it would be starting out at that far corner going about to here and then back to that far corner. So you have this pinch toward the equator and the only way I can think of that this would there would be a physical model that we could actually test, so this is a scientific theory because it can be tested, it can be falsified. To falsify this theory all you would have to do is get a lens that's kind of long, that is double concave, and put a camera under here, right about in the middle, as you roll a ball across the top here. That would be how I would conduct the experiment. So it is a scientific theory in the, the standard classical definition. It is testable, it's falsifiable. Um, this model is not. People say we go to space, I highly doubt that. All we have are cartoons and drawings and CGI and doctored photographs. But this model doesn't work in reality. This spinning of the Earth cannot explain a lot of the Sun's four motions. It can't explain it. This is what I showed in the video. You can't explain it that way. I have uh, maybe another time I'll do a video on the uh, uh, eclipse we had also in summer of 2017 and how the motion of the moon's alleged shadow going west to east is also impossible in the standard model. But that's another video for another time. So um, if anybody has a nifty double concave long lens like this, I would dearly love to do an experiment on it or have them do one. Just stick a camera under here and roll a ball across the top and follow where the sun appears to be as opposed to the fact that you know maybe have another camera watching this actual ball and the camera under here pivoting as it watches this ball, <clears throat> watches the ball going across and see if it appears to do this arc or not. If it doesn't then this model is crap and it doesn't work. But if it does, I think it's a better model than the one we're, we've been given in school. Um, and that's all I have to say today on this topic. Um, thanks for watching.